So your treat today will be a song and dance. Um, so uh, this morning, I, I, for just a show of hands, um, since I've done this many times now, um, who here has been to one of these before? Great. Okay. So glad to see some new faces and welcome. Um, so what we're going to do today, and so obviously I'm not Brian Harvey. We, for these talks, since there's five of them around the state, we kind of divvy up some of these talks a little bit to um, help save some of us of making a zillion talks. Um, and so Brian Harvey and at Children's uh, Mercy Sports Medicine Center compiled uh, most of the talk. And so we'll go through kind of some current research. We actually started doing this lecture last year. Um, just to kind of get you guys up to date of what's gone on over the last year because concussions are ever-changing. Uh, lots of new stuff out there. So these are some of the highlights, so to speak, of uh, some of the talks that have come out this um, past year. So the first talk we're going to, uh, our first uh, research study is just looking at um, epidemiology of concussions. I know this is a slide you're not going to be able to see. Fortunately, you guys have handouts. Um, this probably really didn't tell us much new about concussions. It just looked at high school athletes through a different um, uh, um, kind of tracking system than uh, the high school real system. This was through the, what's called the nation uh, injury tracking system. And so they just looked at high school sports. And I'll point out some kind of highlights to you here. Does this have a pointer on it, I think? Maybe? Nope. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. It's in the middle. Never mind. I got it. Okay. So uh, a couple of things here. So obviously football gets the most attention and, and is the highest uh, likely sport. And what they go by is rate per one or per 10,000 athletic exposures. And so the way that in research for sports and athletic exposure is defined as one practice that a participant uh, does or a game. And so if you have 80 players playing in a practice, then that's 80 athletic exposures. Okay, so if you have one concussion, you've had one concussion out of that 80 athletic exposures, just to kind of help you define what we're looking at. So, so football uh, gets the most attention and obviously highest there. But again, we have to pay attention to the other sports that are up here too. So boys lacrosse is number two, girls soccer is number three, and then we get wrestling down um, here as number four. Um, this is similar to trends that we see, similar to trends that we've seen in Missouri for the tracking that we do through the high schools, um, so not unusual. The other things we'll see here, which is, again, we've seen this many times before in research, that in competition, girls have a higher rate of concussions than boys. Same thing for practice, and then obviously that would make it overall in sports, girls are higher than boys uh, as far as the incidence. We still don't know exactly why that is. There's lots of things and, and some that were discussed before, possibly weaker neck muscles in girls, and so that doesn't control the head as well, which then can produce the concussion. Sometimes people have suggested that girls are more honest than boys as far as disclosing their symptoms, and so that can um, sometimes uh, change that rate. Uh, sometimes that's just it. Um, and so um, there have been some research studies recently that also have looked at hormonal issues um, as far as a reason why someone may be more susceptible to a concussion. That's actually been looked at, <coughs> excuse me, in ACL tears too uh, as a possible reason why girls may be more susceptible um, to tearing their ACL. Um, so, so again, we see these statistics, nothing that's new or magic here, um, but just kind of reiterating radiating some of the things that we already knew as far as kind of where sports are. Obviously, there are other sports that are not on here because some of them are regional, like ice hockey wasn't included on here because it wasn't part of some of the um, schools that were involved in this. So I think this is an interesting study. This actually looked at NCAA athletes, but I would probably uh, suggest that this would also apply to high school athletes as well. And this was actually a survey looking at uh, Division I freshmen coming in basically asking why they think symptoms are underreported or why they would underreport symptoms uh, for their concussion. The interesting thing about this study, and I'll go through some of these individual things in here in just a second, the interesting thing about this is that whether an athlete had had a concussion before and already had knowledge about um, concussions or they never had a concussion before, their answers were the same. So even if they had previous knowledge about concussions and what concussions were all about, they still would talk about the same thing. So I think this is just a culture thing, which will be great to have a talk later about changing the culture in this. So, so the most common reason why underreporting was there is that they think they can tough it out. So the athlete already feels, I'm indestructible, I can work through this concussion, it's not a big deal. Interestingly, and that's 91%, they think they should tough it out, so at least they have some knowledge that they should or shouldn't be doing that. That drops down to 80%. So still not what we want, because we know that they shouldn't be toughing it out. 
Um, but, but again, the mentality is I can work through an injury, which again is a culture thing, uh, is the most recent or most uh, likely reason why. They don't want to be pulled. Okay, again, that's a culture thing oftentimes. They don't want to come out of playing. Uh, they are afraid to lose playing time. Again, this is where coaches can help. Um, because, again, if you stress ahead of time to your team uh, that if they have a concussion, they're not at jeopardy of losing their spot. Or that's injuries in general, and that's one of the things that oftentimes a lot of athletes will describe as far as why they fail to report an injury or having pain is because they're worried about losing playing time. Um, not wanting to let down their teammate or their coaches. Uh, they don't think it's serious enough. 83% um, they don't know they have a concussion. There's lots of things that could be there. That could be an education thing, and we'll talk about that in another research study in just a second. Um, or it could be just, again, it's a cognitive injury. So they may not have the wherewithal to understand what just happened to them. So, so again, that could be part of the reason why as well. Um, they don't want to appear weak. Again, a phrasing to lose their spot on the team, afraid the coach or their teammates will be mad that gets lower down. This is the one I, I'm glad is low, is they don't believe their coaches want them to report it. Only 30% said that, so obviously that means that they are getting a message from their coaches at least the majority of the time that the coaches are hoping that they report it, but still that's not zero. So, so again, you need to make sure that you're emphasizing to your uh, players, if you're a coach, that it's important to report the injury. Okay. And, and we talked about, I think last year we talked about a research study that actually shows that athletes that continue to play after their concussion are eight times higher likelihood to have a recovery that takes longer than three weeks. And when you look at another study that looked at recovery time for athletes that continue to play rather than athletes that come out immediately after their concussion, those athletes take twice as long to get better than the athlete that comes out immediately. So again, if you want your athletes back quicker, get them out. Don't put them back in. Okay, so the question that was asked earlier as far as, um, you know, someone just has a headache, yeah, let them sit out because those symptoms, again, can evolve. They could get worsening of their symptoms later. And if you let them go back to play and they do have a concussion there, the odds are they're going to take a lot longer to get better. And we certainly see this in clinic all the time. So, so this is a study by um, uh, John Letty. He's out in Buffalo. And he's really done a lot as far as uh, changing, again, our culture from a physician standpoint as far as how we manage concussions. And so they looked at ad uh, adolescents with concussions. Uh, and what they did is they, they put them on uh, a protocol as far as a physical exertion. And so starting off of light physical exertion, what is oftentimes referred to as sub-symptom threshold training. And so sub-symptom meaning it doesn't produce their symptoms. And so what they look at, they monitor their heart rate with this as far as um, how, how well they do. What they found is that if they did any level of exercise um, within a week of their concussion, it really didn't affect their recovery. So this is actually a changing philosophy. One of the things I try and stress when we talk about trying to do earlier physical exertion, that doesn't mean they're back doing their sports or their practice, but some level of light physical activity. So what I oftentimes recommend to my patients in the office is at least have them start doing 15 to 20 minutes of brisk walking each day. Um, Remember, these are athletes. They're normally physically active. They don't want to be sitting on their butt. Your body doesn't expect to be sitting on their butt. They want to be actually doing something. So getting these kids up and moving is a good thing. They actually found, though, that those that had a lower heart rate threshold before they developed symptoms at their first visit um, were more associated with a stronger recovery. So that's an exercise tolerance thing. So athletes that can't tolerate even light levels of physical activity and that reproduce their symptoms, those athletes were more likely to take longer to get better. But again, a li little bit of physical activity is good. We're not having them do sports skills or things like that. Um, but again, we want to try and encourage that earlier rather than later. Because also when they have prolonged symptoms, that's actually one of the things that we strongly encourage is some physical activity to help their recovery. Um, so this uh, is a slide that talks about vestibular ocular dysfunction. So, so for those of you that aren't familiar with that, one, uh, one very common thing that can happen with concussions is issues with their balance system, and that's the vestibular system, so they're off, they may feel unsteady, uh, may, may feel troubles with dizziness, um, and there's also issues with injuries to the ocular motor system, so that means that their eyes don't always track appropriately with what their brain is telling it to do. So those kids may actually have a lot of troubles in school with reading, focusing on things, they move their eyes quickly, they get very dizzy or unsteady. Um, so, so that, this study looked at actually the frequency of that, and so, so a lot of kids had that, and it was actually a predictor for a prolonged uh, recovery. And so, so if you had 30% um, in those that they evaluated in the office that were acute um, had some level of vestibular ocular, ocular motor dysfunction, my colleagues in Philadelphia will tell you that that's a lot 
lower than what they see. They see a lot more than that. They've actually reported up to 70% of kids having uh, issues with vestibular ocular motor dysfunction uh, when we evaluate them. And then those that had post-concussive syndrome, and that's kids that have had more prolonged recovery. And usually there's no agreed upon criteria, but usually symptoms that last longer than four to six weeks gets put into that definition, but that's actually, some of that's even being abandoned now. So, so again, that's up in the air as far as this actual diagnosis of post-concussive syndrome, but a higher percentage had that. Predictors of having vestibular ocular, ocular motor dysfunction, if you're a female athlete, if you've had a pre-injury history of depression, if you had amnesia after your event, so you get your concussion and you don't remember things that happened for a period of time after that concussion, um, I'll make one little side note on that because this sometimes freaks parents and kids out when they can't remember what happened after their concussion and they have like a blank period. That's super common and I stress with those athletes, don't worry about trying to get that back because their brain's just not hitting the save button when that happens. And so the only way they're going to remember any of that kind of stuff that happened over that period of time is for someone to tell them, them watching a video of the event, um, or just, like I said, constantly people telling them what happened. So, so I tell them, don't worry about it. You're not going to get that part back. Again, it's just you didn't, your brain didn't hit the save button, it moved on, and then it started hitting the record button again at a period of time afterwards. And then if they had any dizziness, blurry vision, or difficulty focusing, which are oftentimes sign of vestibular ocular motor dysfunction, those were predictors of having this, which makes sense. Um, how about this study? So this looked at lower extremity injury after a concussion in high school athlete. This one wasn't a great study because there's some studies out there that have shown that in the period of the first three months after you have a concussion, you're at a higher odds, about two times higher likely, of getting a lower extremity injury once you return to play. So that's been shown in several studies now. This just looked at overall lower extremity injuries after a concussion, and this was just from a database. So there's not a set time period. It's just any period of time afterwards, did you have a lower extremity injury? So, so it's kind of, it, it doesn't tell us a ton. Um, but what they found is for, for um, looking at this uh, database here, 24% of injuries that resulted in time loss in this group of athletes with this 46,000 injuries, those were concussions. So that's a high percentage of that injury causing time loss. Um, and then for every previous concussion that that athlete had, their odds of having a lower extremity injury increased by 34%. So why is that? Well, is that the concussion? Possibly. Is it because this kid's an uncoordinated, clumsy athlete and they are prone to getting hit? Possibly. Hard to say. Um, do they have residual effects from their concussion related to balance? Possibly. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot now is, is, um, is problems with just overall movement disorders in kids. And what I mean by physical activity movement disorders is kids just don't develop their coordination skills for their sport. They're going into their sport with poor balance or they're training their muscles in a way that actually aren't really appropriate for that sport and that predisposing them to, that, uh, to an injury. And so, so again, that could be it as well. Um, but the concussions didn't increase injuries that did not cause a loss of time. And, and it wasn't really well defined in the research study what that meant. I'm assuming that means I got hit in my lower body, so my leg, I got a bruise there. They counted that as an injury and it doesn't, you don't lose time because of a bruise to the skin, uh, unless you're a really soft athlete. Um, but, but in the big picture of things, again, that, that the, it didn't increase the injuries for that. So, so again, more to be done here, but, but there does seem to be an increase in lower extremity injuries in a period of time after concussions. Um, sleep. This is one thing that I harp tons on with my athletes because, first of all, we already know that adolescents are horrible at sleep. Probably many of us in this office or in this, in this room here today are horrible with sleep. Um, but, but common things that we see because sleep affects our cognition. We've shown it actually if you get poor sleep, it affects your academics in school. It affects your athletic performance. So, so there's huge uh, benefits to getting an adequate amount of sleep, which for a teenager is eight to nine hours per night. So think about that for maybe of teenagers you may have at home or teenagers you deal with of how many are actually getting that. So what they looked at is, is these are college athletes here, but again, this has been looked at in high school as well. If they, had, they were categorized having shorter sleep, no change in their normal sleep, and then longer sleep after their concussion. So those that wound up having shorter sleep periods of time after their concussion had more symptoms uh, after two days and after, um, or after 24 to 48 hours and then two to four days after their injury. So obviously, again, worse sleep have, makes your symptoms worse. And I stress that with the athletes too. If we all get a poor night's sleep and we don't have a concussion, well, we may have a headache. We may have troubles focusing or concentrating. We may feel that the noise bothers us too much. We may be more irritable. Again, signs that we ask about with concussion. So, so they mirror each other so they can add to each other. 
Um, they also showed, which we've seen before when they've looked at sleep effects on impact testing and other studies, that if you had poorer sleep and shorter sleep, it resulted in slower reaction time. So again, you just can't move as quickly, you can't do things as quickly mentally um, uh, afterwards. And so we need to recognize that and uh, manage that to limit their sleep burden. So we do emphasize a lot with these kids getting appropriate sleep. The converse of that happens too though, if you get too much sleep, that also can affect your recovery too. So, so and one of the things and why we try and stress getting kids back into school quickly uh, after concussions is a lot of the kids that stay home become what I call sleep zombies. So they just sleep all day and then that starts to get them a new level of, of sleep and then their body has a hard time adjusting to a normal level of sleep again. Um, this is another one looking at a risk factor of sleep for prolonged recovery. So this looked at mostly teenagers here. And so 34% of them reported some level of sleep disturbance. If they had a sleep disturbance, their average time to recovery was 111 days. So a lot longer period of time versus 29 days for those that did not report it. So it had a three to four fold increase in this particular study of their recovery time. Um, a quarter of them had difficulty falling asleep, 20% staying asleep. And if they did not, if it wasn't a concussion from sports, um, they had a much higher likelihood of having sleep disturbances, and that could be from all sorts of reasons. When we talk about non-sports related concussions, that could be from um, uh, a traumatic event, so uh, bullying as an example, so uh, uh, an assault, a car accident, which that oftentimes does produce sleep issues because sometimes people, depending on what happened around that event, um, that can cause them to lead into nightmares and having troubles with that, um, uh, rethinking about the uh, event, injury or event. Um, only 29% of those that had um, sports-related concussions uh, had sleep disturbances. And actually, and I use this a lot in my office, is 67% um, of those that had melatonin recommended, and it says prescribed, but it's non-prescription. Um, uh, reported improved sleep. And so I see that a lot. I tend to use that as something to help initiate sleep in kids who are having a hard time getting to sleep at night um, as a way to improve that. A uh, study I think we talked about last year, um, or one of the talks maybe that I gave before, we actually do know electronic use an hour before bed, and this applies to all of us, if you use an electronic device an hour before you go to bed, that directly affects your melatonin levels, meaning it decreases it, so then it makes you have a harder time getting to sleep. So, so think about that if you're having difficulties getting to sleep, put your electronic device down before you get to bed, uh, and that may actually help your sleep significantly. Um, how about the concussion laws? So it was brought up, we have a concussion law in, in Missouri. Um, all states have that now. Um, but did it make an effect on the rate of new concussions that we saw or recurrence of concussions? And so um, when we look at this study here, so, so this is the point where the concussion laws came into place in this study. Uh, and we see an increase, although we were already seeing an increase before that. And so, and that's part because, again, there was much more recognition of concussions. We eventually got to the point where a law was uh, made. And so we see that increasing a little bit. And then we're starting to see a decline uh, in the rate. Uh, and again, it's, this is per 100,000 athletic exposures. So, so taking off, and this is for brand new concussions. For recurrent concussions, uh, what we're seeing is actually a better trend as far as uh, decreasing down. So, Again, whether that's an issue because now we have these laws in effect, and one of the things that we know about recurrent concussions is you're most likely gonna get another concussion within, within the first two weeks after you've returned to play from your previous one. And so, so by having laws in effect that mandate you being out and going through a return to play progression, we may be helping the brain to get to the point where you're not as susceptible to having that next one in that two, uh, two week period of time. So, so that could be a reason why we're seeing this drop off here. So the question is, is does it go below ever the point where it was uh, originally? The big reason why we thought that this increase was happening over those several years is not because there's more concussions out there. I, I definitely don't believe that that's the case. Um, but just a more awareness of the injury and people bringing attention to it and seeking medical care for it as well. And this is only the tip of the iceberg because there's still a, a ton of kids that don't even get seen in the healthcare system um, after their concussions. Um, this is looking at knowledge of concussions, and I'll just point out a couple highlights on here from this particular study. This looked at athletes, as far as their knowledge of concussion, coaches, and then parents. And so, so this first um, uh, upper, bar, or upper quadrant here, this is uh, how can you get a concussion? It looked at some simple knowledge questions of how do they occur? Um, coaches were best at that, and that's, I think, part in, in due to a lot of mandatory education about concussions for uh, coaches, which is great. Um, parents were second. Unfortunately, the athletes were last. And so even though we have these mandatory laws that have to, you have to sign off, 
I really question, honestly, how many people actually look at that sheet and actually read what's on that sheet before they sign off on it. You guys all know that. I mean, you get handouts all the time that probably someone didn't read what the heck was on there. Okay, we do that all the time in our own lives with, you got an 18-page document you need to sign for your mortgage. Do you read every little fine print on there? No. Um, so, so again, kids are being lazy. They got to sign it. It has to be done. They're not looking at it. So, so you know, we have these sessions here for, for nurses, coaches, athletic trainers, what have you. We need to be hitting our athletes better, okay? Because I think that's where our biggest problem is, is that, again, they're not getting the message. Um, as far as even how you can get one. Um, how does having a concussion impact the risk of having future concussions? So the questions were asked fairly well there. Again, athletes were behind coaches and parents. Um, how about, do you need to be symptom free before returning to a sport after a concussion? Again, athletes still lag behind there, unfortunately. And then this one here is really unfortunate when we're at the Missouri Brain Injury Association lecture, um, is, is a concussion considered to be a brain injury? Look at how low that is. Okay, athletes actually got it the best, but coaches don't realize that and parents don't realize that. That's one of the things that I start off when I talk to my patients about concussions is, so what is a concussion? So I tell them, it's an injury to the brain. That's the very first words that come out of my mouth after that. So, so we have to understand that because I don't think people get that. And clearly in this study, they're not, which is unfortunate because I think if we emphasize that it is an injury to the brain, people will understand the reason why we take this injury so seriously. So this was that same group, um, and this is looking at some other things here as far as whether they consider um, it, this ask, if you or your child or player sustained a concussion, how concerned would you be about the following? And so, so the, the small bars up here, this is the I don't know, there's not concerned at all, and it goes all the way to very concerned. So very concerned is the maroon bars here. So obviously what we're going to expect to see here for concern for all of these is our parents are gonna probably have the highest bars. And so, so everyone, for the risk of future concussions, high for parents, high for permanent damage, high for effect on their school, high for inadequate protection. Um, for, interestingly enough, the one that is not is the unable to participate. The one that we're the biggest concerned about that were your athletes, which makes sense. Interestingly enough, the coaches aren't that concerned about it, which is great, okay? I'm glad that the coaches in this study were not too worried about their athlete not participating. Um, and then returning to pray prematurely, again, the parents were the highest uh, ranked there. Um, um, so so get just things to think about here as far as what our expectations are and what people understand about concussions. So, so most of my office visits are spent a lot around education of the injury and why we do what we do afterwards. Because I think that's really important because, again, there's still not a great understanding for a lot of people with this injury. For all you ATs in the room, okay, this is where you can... Thump your chest as far as I'm an AT at my school. Um, does it make a difference for you with concussions being at a school? Um, so, and what this study specifically looked at was if you had access to an athletic trainer versus not, did it change your likelihood of reporting a concussion? So, so what was found in this study is that 55% of the athletes would underreport their concussion. So again, still high rates of athletes continuing to play or not telling people. So. Um, Good for you, athletic trainers, is that if you were there at, their, at that school, the, your students were more knowledgeable about concussions, so that's great. The problem is it didn't change reporting to an authority figure, uh, whether you had an athletic trainer there or not. So it still doesn't change that. So again, this is a culture thing that we need to change. It's something that we need to emphasize. Um, but, but again, unfortunately, it's not changing our likelihood of, of reporting. And that's all I got. So that's our update over the year. Questions, briefly. The which one? The yeah. Yeah, well, so they've looked at that as far as how they perform on, on impact testing as an example as far as their level of sleep. If you had less than, uh, I believe it was seven hours of sleep in several studies, you perform worse than someone that has seven to nine, and athletes that had more than nine hours of sleep also performed worse. So, so again, that's the sweet spot for most of us, you know, for, for that age group is, is eight to nine hours of sleep. So, so when I look and review those tests, that's the first thing I look at 
is what the athlete reported as how many hours of sleep they slept last night. Um, I don't care about anything else. I look at that first because that's going to also affect my interpretation of the test. Because um, there are so many factors that go into that test, which again, we can get in a whole debate as far as the usefulness of neurocognitive testing. Um, but, but again, there's so many factors, and sleep being a huge one of those. And if you don't recognize that, you may be missing the boat a lot. Well, so, yeah, so the question was, is it, it seems like the sleep deprivation or too much is a false positive. It is on those performance of the test, so to speak, but actually that test also looked at your symptoms that you had, and athletes that had less sleep or reported shorter sleep durations had worse symptoms than, than those that did not, so. So longer over time actually recover, or just that period? Uh, longer over time, that was the other study that showed that if you had any sleep disturbances at all, you had a longer recovery period than those that did not, but then again, it directly affects your symptoms, and so. And the question is, is it, is it the sleep alone? It's probably not. Again, this is a multifactorial thing. There's so many things that go into how an athlete has symptoms from a concussion, and you got to tease those things out, um, which is why we ask so many questions and we go into so much detail with these kids looking at their, their stuff. And again, when we talk about the person who asked about the headache, you know, again, that's one symptom of 22 we asked about with a concussion, but it's still the most common symptom. So again, if you get the most common system, you got hit in your head, I have to assume, until proven otherwise, that that athlete has a concussion. I'm not gonna just say, hey, go back and play, because I've seen that a zillion times in my office. I, oh, I just had a headache, it wasn't a big deal, and I got back, let go back to play. They couldn't tell me if I had a concussion or not, so they still let me go back to play. Stop, okay, keep them out, because then again, they're back in my office, and they have much worse symptoms as they continue to play or had that extra hit um, and had worsening of their symptoms too. Yep. Yeah, um, so for the kids, like the high school kids that get diagnosed with a concussion and then <clears throat> they go to school and then afterwards they usually like nap, is that like not recommended? And like if so, like how long? Because, you know, you said too much sleep can be. Yeah, so, so again, the napping part of that, uh, so I, I, I try, I don't mind for the first couple of days of getting a little extra sleep after their concussion, but I really want to try and get that kid on a sleep routine and stay consistent with that. And, and the way I emphasize it to my patients is our brain is already confused from the concussion. If we start confusing it by what time of day am I going to sleep, or what am I doing this day, I've got two hours of sleep, well now I get poor sleep at night time because now I've slept during the day and so now I can't get to sleep at night, so then it affects my good deep restful sleep I get at night. So it just spins into a cycle, so that's why I really try and emphasize that. Again, I'm not a, you know, you can never nap at all, but, but I try and really keep those to short periods of time. The two, three hour nap after school, not a good thing, so. How yep. much melatonin are you using? Uh, so I usually recommend three to five milligrams, um, 30 minutes before they go to sleep. You can use up to 10, but I usually start off with three to five. recommendations be? Yeah, so the question is, is uh, the return to learn and how quickly do we want to get them back to school? I try and get kids back to school as soon as possible, but that's, that's a, for lots of reasons, okay? Again, I don't want the kid to become a sleep zombie at home. They get bored staying at home. They get stressed because now they're missing school and they're getting behind in their schoolwork. So, um, and I tell these kids oftentimes when they come into my office, you feel crummy at home, you're still going to feel crummy at school, but at least you can be around your friends, you can be in that social situation, you're not sitting at home perseverating about your injury all day, is this sucks, is I can't do anything, I'm sitting at home, I'm getting behind. That actually adds to the effect of the injury too. We see that a lot, especially in the teenage population, stress and anxiety becoming a very big problem after their concussion. So, so, but that's also important of making sure that kid has academic adjustments at school when they go back to school, and that's through the schools uh, doing that. And so, um, and that's one of the things we try and stress and educate with schools is the schools can do that without doctor's notes. Um, so it's the school's prerogative to do that. So it doesn't have to be, I have a doctor's note that says I need adjustments. If, if you're the athletic trainer at a school, you've diagnosed a concussion, let the school nurse know that, let the teachers and administrators know that, and then if the school starts implementing those um, return to learn things early on, that actually can help that kid significantly. So 
And just, you know, for the teachers, I tell them, just reduce the stress on that student. Tell them, we'll, we'll back off on things for you. It doesn't mean they have to eliminate their schoolwork, it's just a reduction. Just like what we talked about with the physical activity and the research that's been done on that. It's not an elimination of physical activity entirely, it's just a reduction at the intensity level and the duration that you do it, and that will help facilitate your recovery. So, shutting the brain down does not help. Yep, it's okay to sit in there, because like I said, they're going to do it at home too. And there's actually research to show that kids that are at home and do nothing, um, compared to kids that are back at school with adjustments, the kids that are at home and do nothing have worse symptoms and take longer to get better than the kids that are actually back at school with adjustments. But that's again, that's having proper support from the school and the teachers to do that. Okay? And one of the things I stress the most with the kids I see in my office, they have to communicate with their teachers about how they feel. So that's the biggest problem that I see is that they don't talk to their teachers. They don't let them know they have a headache. They don't let them know they have dizziness. Again, just like keeping playing and they want it, they think they can muscle through it. They think they can muscle through school too. And so, and then they don't get those accommodations or adjustments and then that actually makes them feel worse. And so then it becomes again a spiral there too. But again, being at home doesn't facilitate getting them better any quicker. So I mean, we, I tell everybody, you know, it's, concussions again aren't anything new. In the last five, 10 years we've talked about don't have your kids go to school. 30 years ago when I was in high school, there was not a single kid I ever saw that was home from school from having their concussion. And they made through perfectly fine. So we can still do it now. We just give them a little extra help, okay? All right, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Mark Halstead for the presentation you just gave. It's nice to know that research is informing concerns. Thank you. Great job, thank you. We have a 15 minute break coming up and I hope you have time to visit some of the uh, exhibitors outside. I also wanted to quickly point out if I could, you've got evaluation forms on your table. If you haven't filled one out, we'd appreciate if you would, there's a pre-seminar piece and then there's a post-seminar piece. If you would fill these out, we'd appreciate it. And there's also um, a little bingo form. It's sometime today, we'd like if you'd fill that out as well. We'll have a presentation a little bit later about these bingo forms. They provide us with good information, help keep us informed about what's going on out there with you all. So if you could t uh, fill those out, we'd appreciate it. And then I also wanted to say we have this little booklet called uh, Concussion Management, the Team Plan. Um, it's a great booklet. Some of you may have gotten it last year. They're outside at the Missouri Brain Injury Association's uh, desk or uh, exhibit. Feel free to pick one of these up. They're, they're a great resource with good information in And we've got these green books. Some are on your tables. If you don't have enough on your table and you want one, there's some out in the hallway as well. Enjoy the 15-minute break, and we'll see you back here. Thank you.